Thank you, Brother Glenn. So I was, uh, we are finishing up this section in Mark where Jesus is doing a section of miracles and then it enters into, in chapter 7, starting in chapter 8, a second section of him doing miracles prior to his prediction of the uh, crucifixion. And I love preaching on miracles. Miracles are just very interesting. They reveal a lot about God and his character. And as I was reading this one in particular, and we're going to be in verses, chapter 7 of Mark, verses 31 through 37 this morning. Uh, this is a very unusual ver the miracle, and you'll see why it's very unusual. Jesus puts his fingers in somebody's ears, and he spits, and he puts his spit on their tongue, and it's, the question is, and then Mark just ends with that, and it's just, it's really, okay, why did they put this in here? Um, just as known, the Bible is a real book because it has real stories like that. Uh, if this was a made-up book, there would never be, you know, Jesus wouldn't be putting his finger in somebody's ears or spit in their, in their mouths like that. And so we're going to look at this miracle today. And, but what doing, when I was looking at this, was what are some unusual or just really God big heavy miracles that have rerun into and I wanted to find something that's a little more contemporary so as I showed the uh, Billy Graham book on angels he has a story from missionary John G. Patton who was a missionary to the New Hebrides and so he was on this island in the middle of Indonesia, I believe that's where that is, and he was witnessing to this tribe out there and they had decided, we are going to kill him, this entire mission, and their entire family. And so knowing that he and his wife were going to be, they were threatened to kill them. They were going to murder them. He and his wife spent the whole night that they had been threatened in prayer, in tears, thinking at any moment, this tribe is going to break in here and kill us without mercy. Well, it didn't happen. The tribe never came in. They saw them outside. They saw them circling their, their, their little home, and they never came in to kill them. For some reason, they all wound off. They all went away. And so, months later, the very men who wanted to kill him all converted to Christ, and they all came to believe. And so, John asked the chief, like, I saw you all out there. You were trying to kill my wife and I. What, what happened? And the chief said, well, you had all those men with you out there. And they're like, no, it was just my wife and I. He's like, no, no, no. You had those armed men outside of your house. Uh, there was no way we were going to come in when you had, like, dozens of armed men between you and us. And John said, no, there, there was nothing out there. And then they, they thought about it, and they said, well, God must have sent his angels to protect you that night. And so... There was an army of angels, just like in Ezekiel, where they asked that the angels may be revealed to uh, the Ezekiel's aid, and suddenly they're able to see them. These pagan men and women, these pagan warriors set on killing them, saw God's angels armed to the teeth and shining clad clothing, is what the, uh, the chief said. And there were hundreds of them. And they were saved from murder and with God accompanying this miracle of angels, within months, the entirety of the tribe was converted to new life in Christ. And so when we see miracles in the Bible, miracles point to what God is doing. And so as we've gone through the Gentiles showing her faith, the feeding of the 5,000, the touching of the hem of the garment, and so on, each one of these points to God doing something astounding. And you'll see it often in the text. It was astonishing. Mark will constantly record. And so let's read the text, and I'll give you some more background in our section. So today I'm reading from the New King James Version, so if it sounds different again, that's why. But on the screen you'll see it's in the English Standard Version. Starting in verse 31. And again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee, and then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hands on him. And he took him aside from the multitude and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. And then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Apathatha, that is, be opened. And immediately he 
his ears were opened, and the impediment of his tongue was loosed, and he spoke plainly. And then he commanded them that they should tell no one, but the more he commanded them, the more they widely proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Praise the Lord. So, just some background on this section of Scripture. Decapolis was the same region that Legion lived in. And so a few months ago when we preached through that message where Jesus delivered the man from Legion, the thousands of demons, if you remember what happened in Decapolis after he had excommunicated the demons out of that man, they ran into all the pigs, and the pigs then ran into the water and killed themselves. So Jesus saved one man, and at the same time, he destroyed the entirety of the local economy because they were based on pigs, which are an unclean animal. What next happens is, if you remember the text, the man begs Jesus to go with him. He's like, I want to come with you, Lord. And Jesus tells the man of Decapolis, the man formerly possessed by legion, you need to stay here and tell everybody what's been done. And so what does he do? He literally does that. And he tells everyone in the region of Decapolis, which means literally Decapolis, means ten cities, about what Jesus did for him. Now the people who live in this region, it is about 50-50, Jew to Gentile. And so you have a lot of Jews, they would have known the stories and the word of the Lord. You have a lot of Gentiles through just day-to-day -day interaction would have known a little bit of the word of the Lord. And so this man, he goes out and he says, I was delivered from this demon. I uh, was delivered by Jesus. And so these people who literally saw their economy destroyed are hearing about this deliverance from this man. And now a few months later, he comes to this region again. And you could see just from the beginning of the text, um, just starting here, again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the, of the region of the Decapolis of the Sea of Galilee, and then they brought to him a man who was deaf. And so this, and going on further, and he took him aside from the multitudes, and that's in verse 33. The people who rejected Jesus, multitude of them came back to see him when he returned to their region. There's an application there, by the way. <laughs> you might be rejected for now, but months later it may not be the same. And so he came to this audience, and he, he speaks with them, and they come and they see him. Now there's some question as to who exactly is here. Um, I'm thinking that this is a um, probably a mostly Gentile audience that he was dealing with. Uh, why? Because Mark is written to a Gentile audience itself. So the Gospel of Mark is a perspective for those that didn't have necessarily the Old Testament. And so Mark is writing this in a way that a Gentile would better understand. Uh, in Greco-Roman religion, there was always these stories of miraculous healers that would come around. And so when Jesus is, is doing what he's doing, Mark is showing, you may have heard these fairy tales about a guy healing people, but here's actually one that really happened. And so as we read this, that's what Mark is a little bit doing. Also about this text is, this is one text that isn't really explicitly in the other Gospels. My Bible says here, you can see it in Matthew 15, 29 through 31, but it's a little different. And so as we read this, we have to remember, Mark was written by from Peter. And so the Apostle Peter was giving his account to Mark. And Mark wrote down Peter's account. Peter, you have to remember... Peter was just a regular guy. He was a fisherman. And so if you ever met people who are fishermen, they probably have really nice arms because they're pulling in nets all the time. They uh, work hard. They're up early. They have to deal with the water. They have to deal with the weather. And so Peter wasn't necessarily a learned man. He was just a hard-working kind of guy. And so Peter sees this story of this man who Jesus put his fingers in his ears and on his tongue, and it sticks out to him so much that he tells Mark about this. So why did Peter want to say that? Well, I think that you'll see later that this prefigures the cross. But Peter saw Christ do amazing things. In Acts chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, Peter said, 
I have no silver or, and gold, but I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, talking to a crippled man. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong, and leaping he stood and began to walk. And they entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. So Peter himself was given the ability to heal folks later. He saw this healing happen. He consistently saw Jesus do these miracles, whether it was the centurion where he said, yeah, you go, your faith has made him well, or the woman with the chronic illness who touched the hem of Christ's cloak and was healed from the chronic illness of the bleed. Peter records this because he wants this Gentile audience, which unless you're of Hebrew heritage, that's me and you, to know that this is somebody who is more than just a story. That this isn't just one of these miraculous healers that they talked about, but this is actually Christ. So getting into the text, starting in verse... Uh, let's start in verse 31 and work our way through. Uh, we'll start in 32. And then they brought to him who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him. So thinking of the context here, this region had heard about Legion being delivered. They had this friend, these men, who was mute and deaf. Now, what we can tell is from other texts elsewhere, he had an impediment to his speech. So usually if you're born deaf, I had a deaf aunt, she was a a minister to married couples. She, uh, when she tried to speak, it was not the way you and I speak. It was very jumbled. Um, but when you're born deaf, you don't really speak well. The word here for impediment means this person probably knew how to speak, and slowly over time, it started getting more and more jumbled and faulty. And so those of us that are born hearing, whenever we say words in an odd way, either our friend corrects us or we correct ourselves. Uh, those that have lost the ability to hear, they lose the ability to correct their speech. And so when we see this, his impediment to his speech, this is actually one word in the Greek, it gives us a hint that this man probably was born hearing. And what happened is at some point in his life, he lost the ability to hear. And as a result, it impacted his ability to speak. Um, these men heard about Legion getting delivered out of that one man. And so what do they do? They bring their friend to Jesus. And really our application here is, you want to be a friend like Jesus, like this, these men are to their deaf and mute friend. And so really the question here is, if they believed in the Lord so much that they were willing to bring their friend to him, are you and I of like character? Are you and I of like desperation to say, hey, I'm going to bring my friend to you, Lord, so that you might heal them? Uh, the Bible records this in James 5, 19 through 20, if you want to write this down. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. These men, by bringing their friend to Jesus, are like the nurse as you're giving birth. Christ, of course, is the doctor who delivers. He's the one who facilitates the unction by which a baby comes into the world. But you and I are like the assistant who is there to help with the delivery. And so these men, by bringing their friend to Jesus to deliver him from this muteness and this deafness, are like the bedmaid who's helping the delivery of this person in a new life. And it goes here. You will be part of delivering a sinner from their sins. That's an awesome gift, by the way, that we get to be part of God's miraculous work of bringing new life. Uh, also, look at these friends. They had to lead this man who could not speak or not hear. The Bible records in Proverbs 7, 17, a friend at all times and a brother born in adversity. The Christian friend, if you are a Christian, 
is the most faithful friend that you can have. And you should be, just as these, the most faithful friend you could be. So who's your friend, by the way? Your friend is your husband, your wife, your children, your actual friends outside of that. Your friend is your neighbor next to you. The, Jesus records this. You're not going to be perfect, Christian. But he says this, Greater love has no one than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends. And so, Christian, if you're going to be a friend and going to bring your friend, whomever that is, to the Lord, are you willing to lay down your life for them? You know, you might... Uh, I grew up listening to a lot of country music. So forgive me, by the way, for some of you who are against that. Um, a lot of the country songs are always like, we got drunk together and we're in the prison cell together. <laughs> Which, uh, that, you know, a good friend would be like, don't be a dummy, we're not going out tonight. <laughs> like, I don't want to go to jail with you. A good friend will say, your good friends tell you no. You know what I mean? A good friend will say, no, you should do something else here. You know, they're not going to baptize your sins under like, hey, it's all cool. My best friends are just mean to me. <laughs> like, no, what are you thinking? That's, that's silly. They use different words. Um, not strong words because they're Christians. But they uh, will say, don't be, don't be dumb. That's not a good idea. And they love me, so they're willing to say these things to me. But the faithful are the wounds of a friend. And so as a Christian, with your friendships, are you willing to be faithful enough to say the truth to them? And the truth is that without Christ, you're going to hell. Are you faithful and true to love them at all times enough to help them see what's true? Are you faithful enough to grab your wandering friend by the scruff of their neck and pull them back to show them who Jesus is? Are you faithful enough to bring, we can imagine for this deaf man, he might have been deaf a long time. Are you faithful enough to bring an old friend to Christ as these men did. Are you faithful enough to share? The demoniac did exactly this. He went around to the whole region and told every friend he had about what Jesus did for him. Do you love, as these men did, your friend's soul? Do you truly love the soul of your friend? Do you love them? Like, do you actually love them? There's a famous atheist who um, goes out on show, and a man just handed him a Bible. I think it was Penn Teller. And the reason why is he didn't want to... He's like, I believe that you're going to go to hell. And I really don't want you to go there. And so he gave them the scriptures. And that was that. Do you love people enough to tell them the truth, to stop their wandering, as these men did? And so I think, by the way, when Peter puts this text together for us here, where he reveals this actual event that happened, he's thinking of his life where he would go to that crowd of thousands, as we see in Acts, as he delivers the gospel message to the learned and to the plain. And he sees them as the mutant deaf man. And really, the next thing, as we can see in this text, well, why did Mark share about a mutant deaf man being healed of Christ. You look at this. He was, him who was deaf and had been an impediment of his speech, and they begged him to put his hands on him. And he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and he touched his tongue. Well, the reality here is this, and this is not original with me. Before Christ, you and I are both mute and deaf and dumb and blind. We are all of these things. We are dead before we're in Christ. We don't see the things of God. We don't, we don't even want to see the things of God. The Bible records this in Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Uh, you and I were the deaf man brought to Jesus once upon a time. And maybe you were a little one when you were brought to Jesus. Or maybe you could say, Pastor, I got a story. <laughs> and you were brought to Jesus like by these deaf men, by these men. But what it says here is, just as a blind man has no, cannot see, as a deaf man cannot hear the truth, you and I, following what the word of Scripture says, not only do we not understand, we don't seek God. We don't. 
This is just Paul's thing. And because of this, we have all turned aside. It means we go after and we chase after our own selves, our own things. And we have become together worthless. No one seeks to do good. Not one. And so just as this mute and deaf man could not communicate or receive information or hear it, you and I, before our salvation, we would not receive the testimony of God at all. We had no desire to. What is it? The Bible records this before faith when Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So when Paul writes that, he's talking about that in the past tense to the people of the church. He's talking past tense to Christians. But he's trying to remind us that you and I were dead. And a dead man hears no tales. A dead man tells no tales. A dead man does nothing. And what were we dead in? Our trespasses and sins. And every trespass and sin is the breaking of God's law. And we, according to this, just like this, as being deaf and blind and mute, we once walked as following the course of this world. A mute man, a deaf man, a blind man is often being pulled along with no choice. They're led to where they want to be led, where they may not want to be led. I have an um, a uncle who's in a facility. He was just born with special needs. He uh, will never have, until Christ restores him, He'll never have the intellectual threshold above maybe a six-year-old. And so he has to be led to all different places. He has to be brought to things to do. You and I are like that before faith. We are led to where we need to go against our desire, uh, for our, truly our desires. Because we follow, according to the text here, the prince of the power of the air. There's two kings in this world. There's Christ or there's the devil. And you're in one of those kingdoms or you're in the other. And before faith, in your death state, you're in the devil's court. But it says very clearly, in which you once walked. This man was once deaf and mute. You and I were once dead in our trespasses. And so when Peter puts this deaf, mute man, what he's really pointing to in this miracle is at the people that are reading the book, which is you and I. You and I were once deaf and mute. We did not seek him. And by nature, according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we were children of wrath. We were under God's judgment for our sin. And it says, finishing up, like the rest of mankind. So why does Paul write that? Well, because you and I are born with original sin. And so what happened was because Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, sin polluted all of us root and stem from him down to you and me to today. And to any children or great-grandchildren or children's children's children but yet to be born. That sin flows down and covers everyone who is yet born and is born currently. And like that, because of that sin, it causes us to be deaf and blind. Now, I just want to be real quick here. I'm not saying that people sinful and then therefore they become blind. I'm saying that sin causes a spiritual blindness and a spiritual death. Um, special needs, as well as all disease and all brokenness physically in this world, is a result of original sin. All the hardship of the world is because of that sin. And so when we read about this man being brought there, you and I are no different before we stand in Christ. So if you're not a believer today, you are dead and you're being led to greater death by your king, Satan. But if you call unto Christ, you believe unto Christ, you will move from the Satan's kingdom 
to God's kingdom. You'll be a, immune, a member of the household of Christ, but you must call on to him. Otherwise, you are carrying out the desires of your body, which will lead to you experiencing the wrath of God, which is hell forever. I was reading about hell just last night because I couldn't sleep. <laughs> um, you know, by the 300 millionth year of you being in hell, you might have gone over 300 million times every time you heard the gospel and you didn't actually hold on to it. And the pain and the burning and the loneliness and the abject hate that you've experienced in your heart that you'll be feeling for the 300 millionth year. And there'll be nothing you can do to get out of that state. There'll be nothing. You'll just continually think about, why didn't I believe? Why did I not believe? The scripture records this. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us. And you could take the word us and you can put the word me in there, which he loved me. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, even when I was dead in my trespass, made me, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised as, uh, us up with, the, with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and the kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, and not the result of works, so that none, no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that, should we, that we should walk in them. And so this deaf, mute man, he was Christ's new workmanship. For him to undo the deafness, he had to re-sew the nerves in his ears to act together to be properly restored. And so he had to be physically changed. For his tongue to be unmuted, he had to suddenly learn the language completely. And God stored up and rewrote every single pathway in his brain in order so that the words might be able to come out naturally. I mean, you really think about it, it's amazing. When they say they healed the man with a withered arm, I can imagine his arm was probably no longer than this, and suddenly he had a full arm, restored, able to function. When we read about a man being able to walk, I have kids. I'm watching little ones do this right now. It takes a child months to learn how to walk on their feet. And given on how Sarah still walks, I think she's still going to learn how to do it. I mean, given how I walk, I still got to learn how to do it. Um, but... He took a man who was lame and re-knit his muscles and bone, grew them in some cases, made it so their pathways in their brain were able to control an arm without thinking about it, and it was restored. You and I are, if you believe in Christ, you've experienced this rich mercy. You've experienced this great love. You were forgiven of your trespasses. You are truly alive today. You might feel like me, tired, but you're alive. <laughs> and so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus, there will be a day where we are perpetually worshiping God and will experience no lack of want ever again. For by grace you've been saved. We're trying to figure out the middle name for our next child. Um, if it's a girl, we're going to do a spiritual gift. If it's a boy, it's going to be some real Old Testament name. <laughs> um, that's just how we've decided we're going to do it. Um, my wife likes patience, and I like patience for a girl. So we got Grace. The next one in her middle name might be Patience. You can hold me to that. But by grace, grace was, Sarah asked us, what does grace mean then? unmerited favor and love of God. There's nothing you did. God just loves you and gives you good things. And so we, like this blind man upon faith, become, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Upon faith, you are new. You are new. And so if you're not a believer this morning, 
my deaf friend, my blind friend, my mute friend. You can be new if you repent and you grab onto him at this moment. You can be totally made new. The true on-hand workmanship of Christ. You have just to believe. Let me show you something about repentance. Um, we're reading through 2 Kings with our kids every night. And so we're, if you read through 2 Kings, there's always a bad king, another bad king, another bad king, a slightly nice king, and then really, really bad king, and another really bad king. What happens is Josiah comes around. And if you know your Old Testament, you'll know that Josiah finds the book of the law in the temple. And he reads the book of the law, and suddenly... God has done in the Old Testament what he does right here. He opens Josiah's ears and suddenly the word of God hits him right in the teeth. Whoa! We are doing this all wrong. And Josiah repents mightily. It records this. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkalah, the priest, and Achim, the son of Shaphan, and Akbar, the son of Micah, and Shaphan, the secretary, and Isaiah, the king's servant, saying, Go and inquire the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to his written concerning us. The word of the Lord hit Josiah in the heart and he rend his clothes and then literally, and it's not a fun part of the text to read because it's just like a list that Josiah does next. Josiah goes through all of Israel and Judah and he rips down all the altars of the foreign gods. There was even an altar in the temple of God to Baal and he comes and he destroys it and he burns it down to ash and they throw the ash in the water and they rip down all the, the poles and all the sacrifice sites and they break them down and they grind them to dust. Even one the scripture records that Solomon himself Himself set up for a foreign God. When you come to believe, it so radically changes your life that you want to rend your clothing and destroy the idols around you. This man, when he's made new, just like Legion, when he was the man with Legion, was depossessed, when he was exercised of the demon, went and he told everybody. You, if you are a friend, you need to do as Josiah, rend your clothes for those around you. Maybe not literally. We're in church, y'all. Don't do that here either. But be willing to destroy what's evil around you. Apply, and by the way, now this is the king. He, just, he used his power to make sure all evil was removed from the government as well as society. So if you have an authority over something, use your authority to remove evil as well. Because it's a blessing. Moving on to the next part here. This is kind of a funny miracle. Uh, Jesus puts his fingers in his ears, and he puts his tongue, his spit on the tongue, and he heals him. So really, two things are happening in this miracle. First, just really applicationally, if you ever get a chance to hear the testimony of one Christian and then another and another, you'll notice something, that they're all different. <laughs> Every single testimony is different. Some of us have the testimony where it's like, hey, I prayed with my mom or my dad at my bed, and I've been a Christian ever since. I was four years old. And praise the Lord for that, by the way. And sometimes you'll hear that one where it's a real rock and roll story, and you're like, wow, they were at the edge of oblivion, and, and God pulled them out of that fire. And sometimes it's something in between. If we look at the other ways that Christ healed, a woman grabbed onto the hem of his, his cloak, and her chronic bleeding illness by her faith was restored. Uh, later in a different in a different version, the man broke the men broke through the roof of the tent the, the, the residence they Jesus was residing in, and they lowered their friend down on a cot, and Jesus healed their friend. You imagine that story. I was the guy they broke the roof for. <laughs> or in this one, I didn't know what was going on, and my friend just brought me to this guy. Or you, again, you can think of all of it. Or the centurion, a man of nobility, a man like a knight. Just say the word, Lord, and he'll be healed. And he was. What you see here by application is God has given you all a different testimony and a different abilities because we're the body of Christ. Sometimes Jesus with you is going to put his spit on your tongue. 
and put his finger in your ear. And sometimes your story might be, I just grabbed onto that cloak. <laughs> I had nothing else left. I just grabbed him. And sometimes your story is going to be, my friends just brought me to him. And so how I interpret this, looking at the way, then there's going to be more miracles to come. Next week is the feeding of the 4,000. And then uh, seeking a sign and the Pharisees and so on, blindness. When we share the faith, there's no wrong way to do it. Well, there is wrong ways to do it, but there's many a right way to do it. You can share the gospel through the means that God has given you. And so some of you might be more handy. Some of you might be more intellectual. Some of you might be more crafty. Some of you might be more friendly. I don't, I don't know. God has made you the way that you can. More musical. More athletic. There's probably a dozen of other traits you can name. But God has made you part of the body of Christ to use those giftings and tools and abilities to share in the way that's specific to you. He's put into your life people that will respond to your giftings as you use them. Uh, there's a, a member of our church who said, I just hope Jesus gives me a kitchen. <laughs> I think about that's how they want to share. They just want to cook and let people be blessed by their cooking. And I know other people who just like, I just like... I just like making things for people. Or I, uh, quietly on the side, use my law ability to make sure that people have what they need for when their kids are receiving what their inheritance. Or make sure the children are taken care of. Or maybe you have a skill or a job where it's like, yeah, I make sure that when we're running events, people don't get sick or get hurt. I don't know. God knows exactly who you are and what you do and what you're gifted at. Don't be afraid to use your gifting in your own way. If Jesus can heal people in dozens of different ways, how, the same is true for us. There's no one way to share the gospel. Some of you I've known, I've talked to you, you're the kind of person to be like, let's talk about Jesus for 10 minutes. And you know, you're trying to check out at the grocery. That's me. <laughs> the grocery person will be like, oh, we're talking about Jesus. And either the service goes really long or the service goes really quick. Um, but just talking about Christ, what's funny now is, uh, now Sarah's starting to do it, by the way. So I'll be talking to somebody about Jesus, and then suddenly we're just literally at Detweiler's The Meat Counter. She'll be like, how are you, and where are you from? It's like, oh no, somebody is watching. Um, so <laughs> it's really funny, and it's, 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 it's a huge blessing, but at the same time, you have the ability to do it. I guess she has it too, where God has made you to share and bless in your way. The next thing I want you to see here is what's unusual about this miracle is there's a crowd here. And what does Jesus do? He took this man aside. You see that in verse 33. And he took him aside from the multitude. And so while there's many ways to share, when it comes to salvation, it's just for you at that moment. And so Jesus pointedly takes this man aside from a crowd. And there could have been dozens or hundreds of people here. And he pulled just this one man out of the crowd for one-on-one -on -one time to share with him, to be with him. And so just as he speaks to the centurion, the woman with the chronic illness... Just as he fed every single person on the feeding of the 5,000, he was present with all of them individually, just as much as together. And so when you're sharing, really practically, be present with the person that you're with. It's easy to be checked out. It's really easy to be checked out. But be there with them as Christ was with them. You imagine there's a crowd of people and Jesus said, hey, come on over here real quick. And that's what he did. And so be as Christ and be present with the person. Bring them aside. And finally, as we look at this miracle, and I was just thinking before I get to this next thing, you know, we do at this church many things 
that allow us to do missions work very nearly. We're giving a course to Sarasota Medical Pregnancy Center, and maybe your ability to give is, God's given me one more dime than maybe anyone else. Or maybe your ability to give is, we just have more food than somebody else. Or maybe your ability is, I just love being with people, so we go to Manor Care. Or maybe you're, uh, again, able to help put kids in a Christian schooling environment. Maybe you just have some free time between, between putts or between throws. Talk about what God's doing in your life. There's time and the ways for us to pull a person aside to do that. The next thing here, look at verse uh, 33 and 34. And he took him aside in the multitude, and he put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and he touched his tongue, and then looking up to the heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epathatha, that is to be opened. So in the Bible interpretation, there is a, a interpretive method called typology. Okay, hold on a sec. You're going to learn something. Typology is when you look at the Bible and you see things that prefigure the crucifixion, the coming of Christ, and so on. And so in the Old Testament, you'll see things that prefigure Jesus, that look like him as he's coming. And so, for example, when the ark door is shut and they're shut in, you see the prefiguring of salvation where the men and women who get into the ark... Noah and his family are saved eternally, they're shut in by God, and they're saved from the destruction of the flood. And so by faith, you and I, by Christ, are shut into Christ, and we're saved by the destruction of God at the end of the age, when he destroys the earth. And so you see this again and again, where there are people who are Christ-like persons that will come later. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, Christ was in the belly of the tomb for three days. And so you see these various things that look like Jesus beforehand. Um, you see with the Passover, the shedding of the blood of the Lamb, and then Christ, of course, is the ultimate bloodshed of the Lamb. And so in this text here, when you see that he looked up to heaven, he spat and he sighed, he said, Apatha, and be opened, Mark is prefiguring the crucifixion at this moment. You're going to be like, How? Well, if you look at these things, when Christ was being crucified, it happens this, and this is in chapter 15. On the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lamina sabathini, which translated means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he looked up, he spoke. What Jesus was doing was in the same way he took his spit to heal this man's tongue, in the same way he took his blood to heal you and I from our death. In the same way how he said, and Mark translates here, he doesn't translate the word, he says, epathetha. Mark doesn't translate the words, Eloi, Eloi, lamina sabathini. And so again, Mark is setting up what Peter had saw, where this event that happened with this blind man would eventually point to the cross later. At the same time, he looks up at heaven, and on the cross, as Jesus is screaming, Eloi, Eloi, Lamanai, Sabathini, he's looking to his father. Why, oh, why have you forsaken me? And so you see the same thing again, where this moment connects Jesus to his eventual crucifixion. Because the only way for you and for I to attain salvation is by the power of the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And so when you read this text, it's pointing to, as all miracles do, the crucifixion and the person and action of Christ. How are they in common? Just to do it again. Uh, foreign language, epathetha, Eloi, Eloi, translated. Jesus crying out. Jesus looked up to heaven. Be opened. Why have you forsaken me? And Jesus would say, it is done. Tell us die. Same thing again. Now, this type finds its fulfillment in Christ. What is interesting about this text as well is the word here that is behind impediment of speech it's magalos, which that means nothing to you because it's a Greek word. But what's interesting is that word's only used once in the whole Bible in the New Testament. And the only other time it's used is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verses 4 and 6. 
And it's, that's when, from the Septuagint translation of the Old Testament. Now, just follow me for a second, because this is amazing. So, he uses this word, mute. The same word in the Greek translation of the Old Testament is used to describe this event. Isaiah 35, 4 and 6. And I say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, will recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then, the, then shall the lame leap like, leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. And that's the same word right there, the tongue of the mute. That same word in the Greek there, tongue of the mute, is the same word in my uh, New King James Version, impediment of speech. And so what happened is, when they were translating the Hebrew Scriptures into Greek for the Septuagint, they, the rabbis chose this word for the mute shall sing, and Mark, 300 years later, uses the same word. And so Christians, as they've been reading it, as they read these books, suddenly make a connection. Because truly, when it says, He will come and save you, He'll make the blind eyes shall be opened. This crucifixion, this prefiguring of the crucifixion is true. You and I have had our eyes opened, and you and I, as we did just today, literally sing about God. And so, in this text, Mark is also referencing an Old Testament passage and sharing the connection between the God who promised to do these things literally is found in Christ at this moment. They brought him a man with a speech impediment. By the way, the, the history of how the translation of the Hebrew into the Greek for the Old Testament is astounding. God has been arranging history so that he can make this connection for you and I today. Literally a pharaoh in Egypt declared that every book must be translated and brought to him. And so he sent to, he sent to Israel and they sent 70 rabbis and the rabbis translated the book in 70 days to, from Hebrew into Greek. And then they stored up this Greek Old Testament. And what happens with this Greek Old Testament is the Romans and the Greeks take over the whole of the Mediterranean world and they take the Greek Old Testament and people start reading the Old Testament of God. And so throughout all the Greco-Roman world, people start to believe based on the testimony of the Old Testament. And so these people in the Decapolis who might be reading or hearing him say this would have known this text that says, he'll make the deaf, the mute sing. And so suddenly they're reading the book of Mark and they might be recalling this is him opening this man's mouth up. And so God, through his arranging of history, had also been sharing this truth. And by the way, the God who was arranging history then is still arranging history now. He's still putting it together. He's actually put it all together. Excuse me. And he's in control of it at every moment. And so the same God who used this one word twice in the whole Bible is also the same God who's appointing your days and setting them before you, and he knows the end from the beginning, and he knows what he's doing for you, and you could trust him in that. Finally, I want to end with the last part of this, this little section. Look at verse 37. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Christ has done all things well. This testimony, this confession is true. Upon faith, you and I will say the same thing. Christ has done good things, done, has done all things well. When Jesus asks Peter, who do they say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ. Who are you confessing today? Do you confess that Christ has done all things well? The only way you could do that is if you're made alive in him, that you see who he is. Do you feel, do you know that he does all things well? Do you praise him that he has made both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak? You see repeatedly throughout history, people saying Christ is my worth, my value, my all. Christ has done all things well. Is this your confession this morning? Do you confess the Lord with your tongue? Or is this something that's foreign to you? 
if it's foreign to you today, I commend you. He does all things well. Hear him this morning. Oh, sinner, hear him. And if you're a Christian, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten? Has the world sung you to ease? Has the world put you to a little sleep? Have you grown comfortable? Have you forgotten? Have you so seen the goodness of the world that you've forgotten the goodness of Christ? Or do you remember that he does all things well?